Trudeau's great Nazi whitewash unravels. Is Albanese's next? And don't blame Mother Nature for Obama and Hillary's war crimes. Coming up on this week's episode of The Citizen's Report. Welcome to The Citizens Report. It's the 20th of September, 2023. I'm Robert Barwick and joining me today is Citizens Party Research and Editor Richard Barden. Welcome, Richard. Thanks, Robert. Um, in this week's show, we have an incredibly important story that just blows open the, the lies of the last two years that we have tried on our show to correct. Now it's undeniable and it relates to why um, suddenly it's cool to be a Nazi. Hmm. We'll get to that. An actual Nazi, not a not just a, as a pejorative, yeah. the real deal. Um, and Richard is going to tell the story of why 11,000 plus people, probably a lot more than 11,000 people, are dead in Libya, and it ain't climate change. It's the legacy of a war crime that no one's, no one's been held accountable for. Um, uh, remember, uh, help us get the word out. The best way you can do that is share the show on social media, like the show, um, subscribe if you're not a subscriber and if you remember to ring the bell icon when you do. Um, please comment below. The comments are, are valued and appreciated uh, and quite important. And um, if you can help us, because I'm going to give you a bit of an up a quick update on our campaign. Our campaigns only work because of the, the support of the public. Please do help us financially by clicking on the donate button below. Um, but let's get into it because <laughs> I've got two pages of notes here on a very important subject. Um, but we have to get to that first. Um, just before we do, Richard, quick update. Uh, last week, I was in uh, Launceston on Tuesday, Canberra on Wednesday, and um, uh, the town of Junie in New South Wales on Thursday with Glenn Isherwood from the office here. And so Elisa and Craig did the show on Thursday and they were able to present the, um, the power of these hearings into bank closures in regional Australia. And it was an incredibly powerful process. We played a lot of clips from the Wednesday hearing of the bank CEOs. I don't want to rehash all that. I'm going to play one little clip in a second. Um, but let me just say, this is what, the, um, hats off to everybody who got involved in this campaign to help get this, this inquiry up. Because it is kicking goals and kicking butt. And if you had been there in the room when the, the bankers um, were in the firing line last Wednesday, you would have, it would have almost restored your faith in Parliament. Almost. Almost. But certainly the people in the room deserved kudos. And that includes, um, as I said on Martin North's show, Labor Senator Linda White. She was so good going after the banks. In fact, her and Jared Rennick, uh, who has always been good going after the banks. But the reason I'm highlighting Linda White is because she's in, her party's in government. So they can actually do something about this to have a Labor senator doing so well in this inquiry and not holding back. And the way she went after Anna Bly was, a, was something to behold, right? Mm. It, was, it was really good because Anna Bly is ex-Labor. She's ex-Labor Premier. And the person who took her on the most was the Labor senator in the room. That was great. The banks are squirming <coughs> under pressure. Um, but we put out a press release with this week. So what they're trying to do is that they're, 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 um, they're wriggling like mad. And they're making concessions on the one hand. So Commonwealth Bank announced that they're going to be the branch bank for the next three years. They're going to test the waters, they reckon. But on the other hand, they're taking, they're taking it away because they're doing more stuff to push the cashless agenda, right? So they announced that Bankwest is going to go fully digital and yeah. the people in WA should write about that. It's regional <laughs> bank is going digital. <laughs> How does this good, make any sense? Good luck. They obviously don't like people <clears throat> banking very much. If you rely wholly on digital banking, that's just crazy. Um, plus they whacked up fees on what they charge small businesses every day to process their cash from $3 to $10 in one fell swoop, which is you know, roughly 330% increase in fees um, on small businesses. It's just crazy. And of course, that's what they're trying to put pressure on small businesses to go fully cashless. Um, one of the things that's, that shows how well we're doing, Richard, is we get a lot of media coverage on this. So um, we had an excellent, what the, the, probably the best mainstream media article that we've ever had on this issue was in the Finance Review on Saturday by James Ayres. There's what we put on, um, you can see it there, we'll put it on the screen. Um, 
and they quoted me at length. I got to talk to James Ayers quite a bit. Um, he liked he liked the um, he liked my description of uh, Anna Bly. Um, I'd called her a self-appointed cheerleader for a digital dystopia. She is trying to sell as a Nirvana, and um, uh, yeah, that that quote got in there because that's the truth. You could see that the day before, so that was really good. Um, uh, that coverage. Plus, we're getting a lot of radio coverage, and so yesterday I was on. 5AA in Adelaide and 6PR in Perth. Um, these are the big drive time commercial stations, you know, so that you can, people in their cars can listen. And when we talked about Bank West going digital in Perth, I hung around a bit to hear the call ins. And the first call in was from a little old lady who announced that she's blind. And cash allows her, a blind person, to be independent because she can, there's got little braille bumps on it and the, and the notes are different sizes. She can handle cash. She can use cash. She can operate independently as a blind person. But if it's digital, she can't. She will become totally reliant on someone else to operate for her. So these are the sort of stories that come out um, on this. And, and frankly, just look at the volume of, of coverage you're seeing on social media and you're seeing in the press about these questions of branch closures and, and banks going cashless. The coverage means that the, the, the blowback is being noticed. Right? And that means they're not, they're not they're going to get away with this easily. So take heart from that and you know, as much as you can, keep participating in the fight back. Uh, all right, let's leave that there because I could literally talk about that all day, but we've got too important a subject. Um, and this is deadly serious. Um, we're going to go through this in, in quite a bit of detail. Trudeau's great Nazi whitewash unravels <coughs> is Albanese's next so stay tuned for the albanese bit what we're talking about if you if you haven't heard if the media hasn't covered it i know some australian media richard has covered this but we're going to go through the details as you're watching this if you haven't seen this in the australian media let us know in the comments below if you have seen it in the australian media let us know in the comments below i would be interested how much coverage this got in australia it was an, there was one article in the australian newspaper i saw that but see, but see if you if you picked it up elsewhere. Um, but here's the bottom line: the obsessive, irrational hatred of Russia is now allowing real, real, absolutely bona fide Nazis to walk openly among us. And you saw that most clearly last Friday, the 22nd of September, in the Canadian Parliament, when Ukrainian President Zelensky attended to, to speak, give a speech to the parliament and then the speaker got up and this happened. We have here in the chamber today Ukrainian Canadians, Ukrainian Canadian world veteran from the Second World War who fought the Ukrainian independence against the Russians and continues to support the troops today, even at his age of 98. His name is Yaroslav Hunka, and uh, I was going to say he's in the gallery, but I think you beat me to that. <laughs> but I'm very proud to say that he is from North Bay and from my riding of Nipissing to Miskaming. <laughs> he's a Ukrainian hero, a Canadian hero, and we thank him for all his service. Thank you. Now, what a heartwarming moment, mm. Richard. But when should, when should the politicians, if they had a modicum of understanding of history, sense something was wrong? Well, who, <laughs> who, were, the, um, who were the Russians fighting in World War II, Robbie? <laughs> and, and so let's not answer the question, but seriously, <laughs> you're the viewer. Did you learn anything about history in the last 70, 80 years? You just have to know a little bit about World War II. The Russians, they didn't fight the English, they didn't fight the, the Americans, they didn't fight the Canadians, they didn't fight the Australians. They fought 
the Nazis. And so, now, I've got to play another clip in a minute, but um, that's what people in that building... So there's a, few, there's a few alternative explanations here, Richard. Maybe every Canadian Member of Parliament is as dumb as a brick. Maybe. Maybe. I suspect something else. Probably not. No, that's what I'm saying. Exactly. <laughs> I don't think, I don't think that's, that, that's dumb, but it's the obsessive hatred of Russia. Yeah. All they had to hear was fought the Russians, and it was like, oh, good, right? Now, notice also how everybody's standing up. No one's, no one's sitting down on this. Everyone's standing up, including, if you look closely, Justin Trudeau and Zelensky. Were lead. Everyone's applauding the guy. Yep, standing and ovation. Standing ovation. Now, so somebody made this video to point out that they think the speaker actually twigged about what was going on. So have a look at this little clip that someone made of this. We have here in the chamber today Ukrainian Canadians Ukrainian Canadian world veteran from the Second World War who fought the Ukrainian independence against the Russians and continues to support the troops. So, anyway, there you go. That's the speaker. And I, who so knows? Someone's handed like, him this script and he's like, wait a minute. Well, that's right. So, I think, Richard, I think you're 100% right. Someone's handed in the script, except now he's become the fall guy. Because officially, Trudeau says, I didn't know anything about this, right? Mm. Zelensky's administration has said nothing. Um, so you can't blame them, can't blame Trudeau. So they're blaming the speaker, even though he had that reaction. But, um, so he's been forced to resign. The speaker is, is no more. He, he's the ex-speaker now in, in the um, uh, Ukrainian parliament, the Canadian parliament. However... That, that Nazi, he's a member of the Waffen-SS Galicia Division. Yeah. I think they call it the 14th Galicia Division. Yeah, there was a whole bunch of these. The, the Waffen-SS is the, the SS was the sort of elite um, uh, of, the, of the German army. The mm. And they were mostly, you know, they were very closely... Like they didn't, you didn't get appointed unless you were a true believer in the Nazi cause and ideology yeah, yeah, and all yeah. of that as an officer in the SS. And then they recruited all of these locals in the various places that they occupied who um, hated the Russians and were willing and wanted to join the, uh, including a lot of these nationalist type, blood and soil nationalist types, the same ideology as the Nazis basically, just in their own patch, um, as, as soldiers. Um, and so this- um, Who committed atrocities. Oh yeah, all the time. and. Sh to the extent that they shocked the German Nazis sometimes with their brutality, executing whole villages of people, with, like murdering them with farm implements and, and hand tools and things like Including this. Including Poles. Poles, um, Jews, Jews Russians, Russians, basically anyone who didn't fit their Other ideal. Other Ukrainians. Yeah, anyone who disagreed with their ideal of Ukrainian nationalism was the enemy and, and yeah. subhuman and to be killed. Um, and so the, the um, yeah, uh, Galician as they call it in German, or Halicina in Ukrainian, oh, yeah. division. These people, this is an infamous um, unit that's, you know, war criminals one and all. So that's who the Canadian Parliament stood as one to applaud last Friday. And, you know, so you just got to, I mean, this is, a, this is such a touchy subject. For, there's nothing has defined evil more absolutely post-World War II than the name Nazi. Nothing. <laughs> Yet suddenly that can happen. Mm. How is this possible? Well, back to the speaker. He's absolutely the fall guy because that that Nazi. He's 98 years of age. His name is Yaroslav Hunka. Um, his granddaughter put up this social media post of her grandfather waiting to meet personally with Trudeau and Zelensky before this event. He'd already met them. So Trudeau is saying, I didn't know anything. The Speaker organised all this rubbish. This was top down. This was, um, uh, you know, it, I, I'm not even sure how to interpret whether it was a mistake, whether they're rubbing people's noses in it, hoping nobody notices. Mm. Notice someone told me, someone, someone had an alternative explanation saying, look, it was a what they've tried to whitewash their history since World War II. Um, and when you do that, you, you know, your own kids and grandkids can sort of get carried away and not know how bad you really were and mm. try and promote you as a, as a normal person or whatever. Yeah. 
Do you have a theory? Well, I mean, that did happen. I mean, in places like Japan, for instance, that happened where it was systematized by the government. I'm not yeah. sure if that's um, the case. You know, earlier in, in post war generations, I don't think that'll fly in the internet age. No. When anyone like can just type in, you know, <laughs> Waffen SS Galician and go, what? You yeah. know, type yeah. it into Google or your search engine of choice. Uh, no. Um, the other point I, I, I think it's worth making is that, um, you know, and, and I'd like your, you can give a bit of a perspective on this, but um, the fact, how's this guy in Canada, there is a, mm. if you know history, if not, not a superficial version of history, but a bit of history, dip, a bit of depth, in-depth history, there was a very dark chapter after World War II where mm. Western powers um, deliberately took actual Nazis and co-opted yeah. them. Yeah, before World War II was even over, actually, once they'd won in the, the Western theatres, because see, Something that was acknowledged by everyone up to, up to and including Winston Churchill, who hated the Russians, hated, yeah. you know, he was a British imperialist to the core, that all of these things. So, but they acknowledged openly that it was the, the Soviet Red Army that had done 80, yeah. that had destroyed 85% of the German war machine at enormous loss. 27 million people is the official estimate yeah. of citizens of the Soviet Union, civilians and soldiers were killed in that war by the Nazis and their affiliates and, and, and adjuncts and so on, and that they would have won the war, uh, would have taken them a little bit longer, they would have won the war alone. People talk here about, oh, they helped us beat the Nazis. <laughs> we came in at the end and helped them beat the Nazis. Yeah. The Pacific is, is a different story. The war was still going on there, here. But um, immediately they had vanquished the threat British and American, some parts of American intelligence, because there was a s ideological split there between the imperialist types and the, and the, and the more Republican-oriented, anti-colonialist types. And of course, once Roosevelt died, um, then the, the Wall Street crowd through Truman took over again, and that was the em empire builder um, strain of and they America. The, the Dulles brothers. The, Dulles, the infamous the Dulles CIA, brothers who the created the CIA. And um, so they went around recruiting all of these guys for their post, well, they had a they had active plans to make war on to turn around, recruit the Nazis, the what was left of the mm. German Wehrmacht, yeah. um, and just turn around and and bring them all in and, and attack the Soviet Union. Now that didn't fly, um, and that was a specifically a Churchill plan. That's that was Churchill, Churchill wanted yeah. to do. Yep, yep, and so. Uh, all through the, they launched the Cold War in 1946. You know, Churchill coined the term Iron Curtain. They yeah. talk about it like it was something that the Soviets imposed. We imposed it on them, yeah. cut them, trying to cut them off from the world. This was the, the genesis of the Cold War. And they started recruiting all of these wanted war criminals in a lot of cases, known Nazi collaborators and actual uniformed Nazis like this guy. Um, they brought them to places like Canada. They brought them here. Um, the head of military intelligence, a guy called Charles Spry, was running that. And then when they created ASIO in 1949, they put him in charge of it. And they took over this operation of settling them in Australia, in Canada, in Britain and other places, America. And, um, and, and a whole bunch of high level ones in South America as well. But Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but most of them only know about South America. Yeah, this is, but, this but, this, but this is specifically the Eastern European Nazi collaborators and auxiliaries. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So they brought them out here where there are diaspora communities and they seeded them with fake IDs, including presenting a bunch of Ukrainian Nazis as setting them up as, as Russians to propagandize the Russian diaspora yeah, yeah, community yeah. who, you know, a lot of them were here because they were, they, they were anti-communist. They were on the other side of the civil war. Um, when the Russian Empire collapsed. And, um, and so that's why these guys are here. And this was admitted by ASIO's then official historian, who very soon thereafter wasn't official historian anymore. David Horner wrote the first uh, of, the, the first of uh, what became a three-volume official history of ASIO. And he admitted straight up, in a, just quite forthrightly, in, a, in an interview on the ABC, I think in 2014 or 15 or so, um, where he said, yes, this is basically what happened. There was a, there's a book written by a guy called uh, uh, Mark uh, Ahrens called War Criminals Welcome, where he details a lot of this, and it was officially denied when he published this in the 90s. And then, but Horner turned around and said, yes, Mr. Ahrens was essentially correct. That's what they did. Because, hey, if we know they're Nazis, well, then we know they're not commies, right? That was the logic. 
if they're Nazis, they're not commies. And it was all about this, people like Churchill, people like the, the Truman administration, the House Un-American Activities Committee, Senator Joe McCarthy, these kind of elements in the United States who, who established the Cold War, they had to harness this hatred of Russia mm. and the Soviet Union and all things Russian in order to do that. And it became this irrational hatred. And I saw it still... When I was a kid, at the tail end of the Cold War, this mm. irrational yeah. hatred of the Russians, and they tarnished that to create this Cold War that has you know, defined our history ever since. Um, so in the context of that, though, even though what you just... We'll come back, because remember what Richard said about Australia, because we're going to come back to that in a minute. Um, but here's people like Hunka, um, despite this pedigree and the fact that they were actually welcomed in Canada and in Australia... They had to keep their actual, their true history under wraps, right? Mm. They, they kept that secret. And there was a movement in the 70s and 80s where um, uh, Israeli groups and Jewish groups went hunting for these Nazis mm. and that led to some fa famous crimes. But most of the time it was kept secret. And so this guy, Hunka, would have, he's 98. He would have spent most of his life mm. keeping his true identity secret. But suddenly this happens. He must think he's, he's gone to heaven before he died, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. It's like, ha! <laughs> Everything's all good now. Yeah. <laughs> it's the inverse of that line from that Batman movie where, you know, you die a hero or live long enough to become the villain. This is the, this is the other <laughs> way right. around. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so what's happened? This is, the, this is the, what has changed. Now, I want to show, we'll get the producer to put these on the screen. There's a, there's a web, there's a, the Times of Israel, which is an Israeli newspaper, online newspaper. You can, you can go and do a, a search there. And... These are headlines. I'm going to read you a bunch of headlines from a search of the name Stepan Bandera. And this is just until 2022. I'll, read, I'll, I'll give you the dates and go backwards and, and we'll put, the, we'll put the, um, the pictures on the screen. January 1, 2022, the headline in Israel, the Times of Israel. Hundreds of Ukrainian nationalists march in honour of Nazi collaborator. And they're talking about this Stepan Bandera and we'll talk about him in a minute. Uh, March 13, 2021, Ukrainian senior academic proposes renaming city of Uman after Nazi collaborator. January 4, 2021, hundreds march in Ukraine in annual tribute, annual tribute to Nazi collaborator. Um, January 12, 2020, Ukraine tells Israel not to criticize veneration for Nazi collaborators. Uh, are you getting disturbed there's, by these headlines? Yeah. There's a bit of a theme emerging here, Robbie. <laughs> January 11, 2020, Ukraine tells Israel to stay out of the debate about honouring Nazi collaborators. What year was Zelensky elected? Before 2020, for yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So when, when those headlines say Ukraine tells Israel, that's the Ukraine government is telling the state of Israel, do not criticise this. That's the Zelensky government. Ukraine tells Israel to stay out of the debate about honouring Nazi collaborators. August 31, 2019, grandson of Ukrainian fascist reckons with a legacy of Nazi collaboration. That's about Steve Bandera, who's the son of the Stepan Bandera. Mm, who, uh, who's a journalist in Canada. Ah, <laughs> we'll come back to that. That's, that's, a, that's going to be a, a, a relevant point, I think. January 4, 24, 2019, top Nazi hunter blasts visiting Ukraine leader for ignoring Holocaust complicity. Um... December 27, 2018, Ukraine celebrates Nazi collaborator, bans book critical of Pogrom's leader. Pogrom is a race, basically ethnic cleansing. Yeah, yeah. For those who don't know. Um, yeah, you can see it in um, things like Fiddler on the Roof. Um, uh, January 3, 2017, Ukrainian marches in Kiev chant Jews out. November 8, 2016, Jews gather in Ukrainian city that honours alleged Holocaust perpetrators. And the last one I've got is July 7, 2016, Kiev renames major street to honour Russian Nazi collaborator. And what's particularly disgusting about that last one, Richard, is the street they renamed in Kiev is the street that runs to this um, uh, gorge. Where, which was a site of a terrible massacre of Jews mm. in World War II. So the street goes to the gorge and they renamed it in 2016 after this Nazi collaborator, Stepan mm. Bandera, who, who um, perpetrated those types, of, those types of atrocities. Interesting. They call him Russian. Anyway, newspapers. Yep. Um, 
Now yeah, here's ba Baba Yar. That's Baba Yar. That's right. That's mm. right. Um, that's what that that was. So I've given you one country's one newspaper, one country. But that was actually more widely acknowledged than that. You had BBC reports. You had Canadian reports on the on the Nazi problem in Ukraine. Mm. All up until 2022. But come 2022, suddenly the Ukraine the Ukrainians Ukraine's Nazi problem magically vanished. Yep. And then everyone, the newspapers and all of these national leaders, including Anthony Albanese in Parliament, there's video, you can go and watch it, um, start chanting their slogan, repeating their slogans, the Slavo Ukraini thing. And that was that, that was so. Um, Turn around like that. So, how that. does it go? How's the slide? It's yeah. one of the, it's the, it's the, the fascist style, the um, call and response. So, it's, um, it's Slavo Ukraini, Geroyam Slava, means the, 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 the call out is, is glory to Ukraine and, um, Geroim, the response, Geroim Slava or Geroim, depending on your regional accent, means um, glory to the heroes. These are the heroes. Yep. Um, the, these Nazis and Nazi collaborators and ethno-nationalist lunatic mass murderers. And people would have heard most, by now you would have heard, if, you've been, if you follow the news even slightly, you would have heard mainstream politicians using that term or writing that term Slava Ukraini. Right, including, as you said, Anthony Albanese. And I'm glad you said that because we're about to come to him. Because is this just Canada? Now, Canada, I am assured, um, I've been in discussions with the people, does have a particular problem with this, but it's not just Canada. Because Australia's parliament has also effectively whitewashed a Nazi walking among us. And the person who did it, was none other than the man who's now our Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese himself. So I'm going to play a clip. This is from February 2022. And this is just as the um, Russian military operation, you know, shorthand invasion of yeah, Ukraine yeah. begins, right? In February 2022. Anthony yeah. Albanese gets up in Parliament and says this. And this is from his own um, Twitter account. Right, he, he plays his own video of him saying this. Listen to who he says he met with. Last Friday, I met with the chairman of the Australian Federation of Ukrainian Organisations, Stefan Romanyu, and other Ukrainian community leaders in Melbourne. And I indicated to them Labor's clear position of solidarity with the people of the Ukraine and our absolute rejection of any Russian military action that violates Ukraine's sovereignty and its independence. Yeah. Labor stands with the people of Ukraine and all Ukrainian Australians at this difficult time. If Russia continues down the path of aggression, it will be attacking one of the core principles of the post-World War II order, which is that all UN members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. This is a simple, clear principle. Mr Putin must understand that it is not in the long-term interests of the Russian people to continue down this path. The era of spheres of influence and other such pseudo-imperial constructs has been consigned to the dustbin of history. Australia should unite with our allies and friends in sending the strongest of messages that Russia needs to back off, and it needs to back off right now. Yeah. Order. So the name of the person, he, the, the correct pronunciation is Stefan Rom, Rom, Romanyov. 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 Stefan mm. Romanyov, R-O-M-A-N-I-W, who is the co-chair of the organisation of, oh sorry, the um, Federation of Ukrainian Organisations, yeah, the Australian Australia. Federation of Ukrainian Organisations. He's the co-chair of that. That's who, that's who Anthony Albanese said he met with. But he's not just the co-chair of that. Who is he? Only the guy who was the global chairman for 12 years until about 2021 of um, OUNB, which means... Uh, <laughs> the organization of Ukrainian nationalists Bandera section. There was a split in this organization way back. Um, Bandera meaning the same guy those Stephen, Israel, Times of Israel yeah. headlines were about. They had to come about. Oh, there was. Um, they they both uh, branches of it worked with the 
with the Nazis to varying extents, but there was just a, there was a, an, a, more a political than an ideological split um, about who should be in charge and how things should be done. But so there's OUNM and OUNB um, and uh, yeah, the OUNB spread all over the world because of this, this uh, extraction and, and uh, uh, recruitment of these Nazis and Nazi collaborators that we were talking about before. Um, so this guy um, was born uh, in Australia, this Stefan Romanov. Uh, but uh, according to the uh, information that a colleague of ours um, was able to find, yeah, his father, um, Ilya or Ilka, depending, he was. Well, the, there, he, is, there, is, there are claims that his father, we're, we're, we're trying to confirm that. Yeah. That doesn't change the what's relevant about him, but this, this part should be, we're, we're trying to confirm this. So we'll say it now, we, won't, we haven't confirmed it yet, yeah. but what do we know? So there are claims um, by Ukrainian nationalists, yeah. mind you, um, their side, that his father was also a member of the SS Galician, yeah. like old Hunka who got the ovation in Canada. So and, ca and came here in 1949. Um, yeah. As did my grandfather. My grandfather came from England in 1949. Um, he had spent a few years in Germany, my grandfather, after World War II, guarding Nazis in prison camps, mm. including, um, he told me just before he died, for a little while there, he guarded Klaus Barbie in yeah, a right. prison camp. Well, there, you um, go. there you go. I thought, oh, really, Pop? <laughs> um, a bit of history there. But um, so he, so uh, this was 1949. They come to Australia, and so. The son, Stefan Romanov, Romanov is born here, right? Um, but from this position in Australia, he is elected the global head of this same organisation of Ukrainian nationalists, B for Bandera, the main collaborators with the Nazis in Ukraine. And it was an often on, on again, off again collaboration in a sense, right? Because mm. um, what what the what the whitewashers try and hide behind is there was a there was a period there where you, where Bandera ended up in a in a, um, a Nazi prison camp well right? sort of sort I mean of, he yeah. was in a, what they might call administrative detention and his men he was still planning <laughs> missions they overstepped their bounds they declared independence from everyone including the Nazis really? and that wasn't going to work for yeah, the Nazis yeah, yeah, yeah. so they they took him and a few others um, to Germany and kept them you know uh, in but what you said before but, is, but is yeah, the most his, his men kept working with, he kept planning missions, his men kept working with the Nazis. They were supplied with weapons and intelligence and all the rest of and, it. So and, and it wasn't just, the the, the the collaboration was not just the enemy and my enemy is my friend. They actually shared the ethos. Yeah, yeah. The it's, racial hatred of, of Jews and other minorities. They shared all that with yeah, the Nazis. Yeah, the, the, the OUN crowd were, were Nazis before the actual Nazis. They predate them as an organisation by several years. There so. you go. There's a bit of history for you. Um, now, so uh, here's, a, here's a website, um, and we'll do the Google translation into English version. This is actually a Ukrainian website. And you can see the headline identifies Roman, Romanov as the head of O-U-N-B. It's right there in the headline. And if you scroll down there, you'll see the, the different scenes of him um, uh, at different events of this thing, including including um, uh, summer camps, where which is a, a quite a thing they do to indoctrinate kids. There's another photo I want to put up now, which is him addressing an O-U-N-B event. And you can see the big portrait of Bandera in the background. Um, now, uh, I've had discussions, Richard, as I've told you, with... Um, locals in Australia who are also Ukrainian Australians who hate this guy mm. and they have told me that the it is absolutely true that the Ukrainian diaspora around the world has a massive Nazi problem. Now they they also claim to me that they, they tried to downplay the Nazi problem in Ukraine. Mm. They're very pro-Ukrainian, the people I've talked to. They're very anti-Russian. It's just that they actually hate the, the, the Nazis, right? Mm. They think because because then you get a bad name with events like happened in Canada. But what they acknowledged was that the, the diaspora, which is the Ukrainian populations in places like Australia, Canada, etc., have a serious Nazi problem. Mm. And the fact you said before that Steve Bandera, the grandson, is in Canada. If I remember correctly, yeah, is, um, is an example of that. Canada has a particular problem, and it's and it's and it's hard to hide. 
And just describe Christia, the, the, what's her name? The, what, she's the foreign minister. Christia Canada, Friedland. She, her, her grandfather was a, was a uh, propagand, he's Ukrainian, uh, Mikhail Chemyak. Uh, he was a uh, propagandist for the Nazis in the Ukrainian language. He, they took over a, uh, a newspaper that was uh, uh, published by a, a Jewish guy and they turned it into a propaganda organ for, for these nationalists and for the Nazis and, you know, uh, and he was the guy who they uh, put in charge of. And she's now the foreign minister she's of Canada. The, yeah, deputy prime minister and foreign, uh, foreign minister, I think. I think she's a foreign minister. She, and when, she, when there was a little bit of a scandal a few years ago about her Nazi roots, because, and the Russian embassy actually said, yeah, here's who her grandfather was. She deported about four Russian um, diplomats out of the country to shut them up. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's, so Canada is actually a bit of a hotbed on this, but, but as we, if, if the global head of this movement is in Australia, or he was global head until mm. 2021, we're also a hotbed of this. Um, I want to play a little clip now, because in April this year, Senator James Patterson, who we talk about too much on this show sometimes because <laughs> he's one of the he's one of the people that used the reason these these well this ukrainian organization in australia who was complaining to me about this they can't believe that they cannot get traction for people to actually see they're complaining to the media they're complaining to politicians they're complaining to he even told me they're complaining to leaders of the jewish community why are you not exposing these nazis in australia these are we're ukrainian um we don't want them. Why do mm. they dominate and you're not listening to us? And he's, he, he, he told me, I can't believe we don't get any traction. Well, they don't get any traction because the Nazis dominating the Ukrainian community serve the purpose of the Anglo-American powers, mm. right, that are trying to use Ukraine at the moment. That's why they brought them here post-World War II. Exactly. And one of their stooges is Senator James Patterson. So back in April, he had a, he had a hearing for the Senate inquiry into foreign interference through social media. Um, he invited R Romanyev's organisation, the Australian Federation of Ukrainian Organisations, to testify. Now, Romanyev didn't go. He's the co-chair. He sent his other co-chair, who just happens to be Canadian. She's brand new in Australia. She's just popped up. I want to play the clip of Ag Agaru, her name is. Just This is not an important clip, but you'll see you'll see James Patterson introducing her to this inquiry. Have a quick look. Okay, the committee will now resume and I welcome Mrs. Katerina Agayu. Um, for the Hansard record, could you please give your name and the capacity in which you appear today? Yes, my name is Katerina Argeru. I'm the co-chair of the Australian Federation of Ukrainian Organisations. Thank you. We're very grateful for your time before the committee today. Um, so, that, so she's the co-chair of his organisation, right, of this organisation of Ukrainian... Um, now, we're running out of time here, so I, I, I just want to give a, a certain... Um, we'll have to skip over a bit of stuff, but um, what the, what the organisation does... So this is... So let's just be clear. There's an organisation of Ukrainian nationalists, OUNB, that Romanyev was part of. He doesn't go around describing himself as that, right? That's kind of hidden in the background. What they officially are is this... Um, Australian Federation of Ukrainian Organisations. Now they have a website, most of which is in Ukrainian. So the average person, Australian person, Australian politician, remember this is an Australian organisation, but it's mostly in Ukrainian, they, they wouldn't be able to read it. Um, so uh, he has his letters written up there. Uh, he's written a bunch of letters over, over the time, but you can translate the letters and actually um, see something. He signs off on all the letters with Slava Ukraini, that, like Richard was talking about, the fascist slogan. Here's, here's a bit of a sample, just to show you what an ideologue he is. August 2015, he wrote, Today, the concept and experience of the OUN are especially relevant in the conditions of a bloody confrontation with the northern aggressor, Russia, and his henchmen. Uh, June 2016, he stated, OUN members understand what kind of state to build and understand how to build it. Our task is to make future generations of Ukrainians proud. This will be exactly like the European Ukraine, which was bequeathed to us by the soldiers of the UNR Army, OUN Undergrounds, UPA Fighters, and the UPA is the Ukraine Insurgent, Ukrainian Insurgent Army, which was founded in 42 as the OUN's paramilitary wing, and for which the defenders of Ukraine are now competing. So this is, we'll leave it there, but this is, this is a guy applauding all that in, right? Um, but then this, this is the most important thing, detail specifically about this organisation. 
the Federation lists its members on its website. We're going to scroll through that page of the members, the member organisations of this Federation. Um, the Australian, remember it's called the Australian Federation of Ukrainian Organisations. And then let's stop at this one. The Brotherhood of Ex-Servicemen in Australia, it's called. Mm -hmm. Right? The Brotherhood of Ex-Servicemen in Australia. That's the, that's the, the bland English name of this organisation on the website. However, see the see the um, the Ukrainian name language name beside it, which would be un, I wouldn't be able to pronounce. When you take those that name and Google translate that back into English, the translation is Regional Administration Fraternity of the First Division of the UNA, which is the Ukrainian National Army. Now that UNA was named the UNA in 1945. Before 1945, it was the Nazi Waffen SS Galicia 14th Division. The very same division as the 98 year old guy in the Canadian Parliament. That, they have a branch in Australia which, which is a member of this Romanov's organisation which gets to testify before Parliament and attack members of Parliament for being Russian stooges. That's what they, I don't have time to show you, but that's the sort of stuff she was doing. That's why Patterson had her there that gets to meet with the Prime Minister of Australia. The day Albanese said that, by the way, he was the opposition leader, but Morrison gave a speech mm -hmm. the same day, I'm playing Albanese because he's now the Prime Minister, where he also said he'd met with Romanov, right? They get to speak on behalf of the whole Ukrainian um, population of Australia, and they are Nazis, and no one says a word. Where's the accountability for this? And we come back to it, Richard, um, the only way this can happen, and people have to take stock of this, the only way that suddenly the, very, the, the touchiest thing for 70, 80 years post-World War II, the definition of evil can be, can be completely ignored is because of an absolutely overriding obsessive hatred of Russia. And an obsessive hatred of Russia that you see, in, in it, and it's one thing to say, well, yeah, they've earned it because you know, they've invaded a country, etc. But the people who are the most insistent about that are the same people that have said nothing and do not care about our war crimes. We're going to talk about another one in a minute in Iraq, in Libya, in Syria, etc., which have killed many more people, caused much more damage, right? Um, they're okay. In fact, John Kerry, the former US Secretary of State, was challenged on French television about carrying on about the Ukraine invasion. They said, what about the Iraq invasion and George Bush? If Putin's a war criminal, then George Bush is a cr war criminal. And John Kerry said, but that was different, right? So those are the people telling you that the Russians are evil. This is the most immoral war ever, ever, etc. And that hatred allows them suddenly to overlook the thing that we've defined as pure evil for 80 years. We have to take stock as a country because what's happened in, Ukraine, in Canada is, is exactly what's happening here in Australia. All right, running out of time, let's move on. Um, Richard's got a story to tell and it's an important one. Don't blame Mother Nature for Obama and Hillary's war crimes. And what we're talking about is there was a massive flood in Libya two weeks ago, <coughs> killed 11,000 at least, probably 20,000 yeah. people. And, and because it coincided with a rather large w rainfall event mm. across the Mediterranean, it's being blamed on climate change. Yep. What's the real story? So, yeah, there was a storm, a, a cyclone, basically, Mediterranean cyclone dumped a whole bunch of rain in several countries, including in the northeast of Libya, because that's what it what what it does. It's a it's basically desert, but it's like some of the Western American desert. It gets very heavy rainfall at certain times of the year, and it all just washes down and flash floods these low lying areas. And, and um, we'll put it. We'll play while we're talking, Richard. Um, we'll play the. There's an animation I found on YouTube, which is really good. That shows the topography of the area that Richard's talking about. Yeah, so in this case, um, it's a city called, um, I'm, I'm, I can't pronounce the, uh, the Arabic, but in, it, in English, and uh, it's called Derna. Derna, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so there's, a, there's one of these seasonal rivers, the Wadi, they're called in, in Arabic, um, arroyos, dry wash, whatever you want to call it, whatever you know them as. Uh, and this city, is, it's a small port on the Mediterranean coast in, in northeast Libya, is built straddling this, this riverbed that's dry most of the year. And every so often it 
floods sometimes quite badly. And there was a series of these things, well, forever, but yeah. um, uh, there was a, a run of them in the first half of the 20th century. And so in the 1960s, the previous, the, the, the king then, as it was of Libya, King Idris and his government commissioned a, a study, what do we do about this? In the 70s, because um, Muammar Gaddafi took over in uh, 1969, the revolution that he led that overthrew the monarchy, uh, and they built these flood mitigation dams upstream of the city, uh, which they used them to store a bit of water, which is generally not a good idea with dams that are built for flood mitigation, but apparently they were designed to do that. Um, but they're largely kept empty so that when there's a flash flood, it holds the water back and lets it out slowly and yeah. doesn't wash the city away. The problem is they hadn't been maintained. Um, they've been cracked up and, and in need of major repair since the late 1990s, but nobody did it for reasons we'll explain. Um, and, uh, and so uh, when this uh, near record rainfall event happened, those dams filled up and then burst one after the other. And the, the bottom bigger one is only a kilometer away from the city. And so they got a seven meter, like a tsunami, but in reverse, going out towards the ocean. And it washed whole neighborhoods of the city into the Mediterranean Sea. And it um, now in basically the, wrecked the joint. Yeah, and you can see, you can see, we'll put some other footage up there where you can see the devastation in that area you saw in the animation. But Richard, in the article you've written on this in the um, alert service, you describe how the, you know, there was acknowledgement from the 90s that this had to be addressed. Yeah. Um, and there was a plan that was starting to repair them um, that started in 2010 that couldn't be completed. Why? Yep. So the short answer is five months after they started it, um, the uh, British, Americans, French decided they were going to do their regime change war, uh, cheated on their... Um, that they got an authorization from the UN Security Council to enforce a no-fly zone, and they used that as a air cover campaign for a, a rebellion led by their pet jihadist Al-Qaeda-linked groups to overthrow Gaddafi and murdered him on uh, live broadcast on the internet. And uh, the place has been mired in civil war and, and terrorism ever since. Uh, nothing works anymore. And when they, sorry, when they weren't murdered Gaddafi, people might have seen this. Play a little clip here. This was Hillary Clinton's response on hearing the news. So, I mean, that is the land of unconfirmed reports. Yes, we came, know. we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> did it have anything to do with your visit? No, oh, I'm sure it did. <laughs> yep, and the reason she was so happy about it and the reason that this dam hadn't been repaired when they noticed it was broken in the 90s is because Libya has been under one form or another of US sanctions and threats and intimidations and military uh, interventions, overt and covert, since the 1970s. Yeah. And so... Uh, Which are acts of war anyway. Themselves. Sanctions are war. Yeah. Um, you know, this is, and it's not me saying so, it's the, it's the UN <laughs> charter. Um, but uh, yeah, so they... They did what they always do. From 76 onward, they started, from 72 onward, I should say, they started winding back. So three years after the revolution, Gaddafi's revolution, they started winding back diplomatic uh, engagement, putting pressure on the government, you know, helping out its rivals, destabilizing the joint. From 79 onwards, they started, uh, from 76 onwards, they started uh, things like, you know, not honouring contracts for military aircraft that they'd already paid for and stealing, thing, you know, basically yeah. stealing from them. 79, they designate them a state sponsor of terrorism for supporting... Uh, they weren't too, too concerned about the tactics of the independence groups they supported, but, hey, the Americans were sponsoring what became al-Qaeda at the same time, so they can't complain. And, by the way, the, the first official complaint at um, uh, Interpol about al-Qaeda was made by Muammar Gaddafi yep. in the mid-90s. Um, yeah, he was, the, he was the fiercest opponent of al-Qaeda yep. for the longest of anybody. Yeah. Because um, he knew what they were. I mean, you know, they've got Egypt next door with the Muslim Brotherhood yep. and all the rest of it that we don't have time to get into. But, uh, and that northeastern part of Libya was the sort of headquarters of uh, some of these 
groups domestically, um, which created political tensions and sort of put a handbrake on things getting done there. Um, according to you know, various sources. But the main reason is that, yeah, the Americans tried to make it prohibitively difficult for the Libyans to get uh, outside contracts because they might decide to close down your bank account the next day because you're doing business with the supporter of terrorism. Yeah, yeah. All the things that they've been trying to do to the countries like Venezuela and Russia and China that in recent years. And so you can't have that kind of attack on a country without it taking a toll on its yeah, infrastructure, yeah. etc. Yeah, and so particularly once they got the got them uh, the sanction some sanctions introduced via the UN after the the Pan Am 103 bombing and and some bombings of things in Germany at Disco and a couple of uh, train stations in different parts of Europe that they blamed on the Libyans although it's doubtful that they were actually involved at all I mean even some of the victims families became activists for the guy who was convicted really? of blowing up yeah of blowing up the uh, Pan Am uh, Flight 103, the Lockerbie bombing, people will have heard, of, will know it as, blew up over Scotland um, because it just didn't make any sense. But mm. they, it, it worked for long enough to convince, like the, the no-fly zone thing. Later, they managed to convince the uh, the the rest of the UN Security Council, because this is three permanent members of it: the US, the UK, and France, that were responsible for the for the 2011 um, war. Uh, they convinced the other members to uh, to imposed these sanctions and uh, inflation went through the roof, uh, pay stagnated, uh, you know, multiply what we're seeing now in the Western countries yeah. by about a thousand percent and you've got what they did to Libya. And yet, despite all that, they still had the highest human development index in Africa. They had the highest average salary in Africa, the best education, the, the best healthcare system. Gaddafi and his government for you know whatever their quirks and foibles you don't have to like them you don't have to agree with their ideology or any of that but they managed to do all that despite being under sanctions and threats of war and actual bombings periodically by the world's greatest military power for 50 years 40 years and I, and this is only anecdotal but um, in 1995 just after uh, I was married uh, where I was renting the the, uh, the the heater went on the fritz so the owner was Libyan, he sent around his cousin, the plumber, <laughs> Libyan plumber, and so we were chatting, and he, we were talking about Libya, and I didn't know very much about Libya, and he told me that as a Libyan, he got about $5,000 a year at, sent to him as a check hmm. by the Libyan government, even though he lived in Australia, that was his share of the country's oil well, revenue. Yeah, the, and any surplus oil revenue each year was dispersed to the population. Yeah, and he, he got it in Australia. Yep. Um, and... Uh, <laughs> And yeah, what they what he couldn't do though was get these get contractors in to fix these dams yep. and a bunch of other infrastructure. They did what they could domestically and and with other partners that were willing to make the investments and help them out with things. But uh, these this you know between the political instability that was also fostered from the outside um, and the and the sanctions that made private companies afraid to do business in Libya especially with anything state owned which this was a, you know these dams were, were owned and maintained owned and, and operated by the the state uh, water authority um, that was subject to sanctions that you had needed to get a waiver from that could be rescinded <laughs> at any time and so they couldn't get until 2007 because the Americans the UNSC lifted its sanctions in 2003 2004 once they were satisfied, satisfied that Libya wasn't sponsoring terrorism and had given up its weapons of mass destruction. Uh, the Americans and the British, but in this case the most effect was from the Americans, um, found excuses to extend their sanctions for another three or four years. So it's only in 2007 that they get this Turkish company in um, to have a look at the dams and, and put up a proposal of, you know, how, and, and then negotiate the contract of how they're going to fix them. Yeah. They start in 2010, five months later, yeah. boom, it's all off. And so nothing's been fixed in the meantime. And that's why these probably 20 odd thousand people, at least 11 and a half thousand, according to the Red Crescent, yeah. are dead now. And that city is destroyed and will probably never be rebuilt. 40,000 people displaced. Um, that's why, that's who did it. It's, it's so important to know these details. And there's probably, um, you know, the Iraq war is, 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 is much more well known, but when you understand the full story of Libya, I mean, it, it's almost up, it, it almost ranks beside Iraq as the war crime of the 21st century. 
And, and you would also agree that it's what, more than anything else, it destroyed any trust that may have been left between the Russians and the Anglo-Americans. Hmm. That the lie, Obama, uh, Obama guaranteed the Russians if they didn't veto the Libya intervention in the Security Council, the, the no-fly zone, yeah. it wouldn't turn into a, a regime change war, and it was a lie. And Putin wasn't pr president then. He, he was, was prime, prime minister. minister, and he broke ranks and, and said and, and disagreed publicly with the then president, Medvedev. He was warning. The, don't, don't go along with this. Yep. They're going to... He, told, he warned him and yeah. got officially reprimanded for it and, and uh, they let it happen. And, and since then, uh, Medvedev's become more anti-Western than Putin ever was. Yeah. And there's so many <laughs> knock-on effects. So, there's so many knock-on effects, not just this, this terrible disaster in the last few weeks, but the, almost the whole European refugee crisis from North Africa is entirely because of this, yeah. this Libyan war. And they were warned about that as well. North Korea arming up is entirely because of this... Because when... Gaddafi gave up his weapons of mass destruction in order to be accepted by the West and they killed him. The North Koreans said, no way, no how. We're, yep. we're never going to give up our weapons of mass destruction. Yep. And All they developed sort of nuclear ICBMs because of that. Because of they that. didn't have them before. No, exactly. And these are, this is entirely on the West. The, the Brits... The Americans and the um, the French and the like, and all the hangers on and like the Australia Italians as well and yeah exactly all right we are definitely out of time um, I'm f I'm I'm um, feeling sorry for the producer he's not feeling too well today so let's let's um, give him a give him one minute's grace um, we're going to say goodbye remember the seriousness of this conversation we usually like talking about good news about banks we gave you an update on that but these are two very very serious issues especially this uh, t absolutely appalling state of affairs where because of the hatred of Russia, which we are indoctrinated to have, Nazis, the Nazis are now openly walking among us. Don't accept it. Help us fight it. You'll see material we'll put out about this. Con challenging members of parliament, challenge everybody. Why is this being allowed to happen? Um, but with that said, we're out of time. So Richard, thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks, Your Robert. insights and information as usual have been invaluable. Thanks to the viewer for tuning in. Tune in next week for more of the Citizens Report. Authorised by Robert Bowick, Citizens Party, Melbourne.